Tonight, the infrastructure minister says legal challenges to the upgrade of the A5 road are a huge problem. Their objections are causing delays. Those delays are costing lives. That's the stark reality of the situation we're in at the moment. And John O'Dowd also reveals the latest problem that's contributing to the length of MOT waiting lists across the country. We'll assess the issues and the challenges facing the infrastructure department with one former minister and two other keen observers. And with the identity of the new Taoiseach looking like a racing certainty, we'll hear the latest odds from Dublin. Hello. When the executive was restored last month, John O'Dowd was one of the few ministers to return to his old department. Infrastructure covers a wide remit, and it's fair to say the man in charge has a lot of plates to spin. When I spoke to Mr O'Dowd earlier, I began by asking him about what he's already referred to as one of his key priorities, potholes. It comes down to we are currently running a limited service because of the financial situation my department and the executive find itself in. So it's far from satisfactory, the conditions of our roads, our, our, our ability to respond to the needs of the public in this regard. So it comes down to measurements in terms of we try to fix the, the worst potholes as quickly as possible. And if we can, we get around to other lesser defects in the road as, as time allows, as finances allows, and as personnel allow as well. Um, and of course, it's not just the motorways, it's not the main roads, it's the uh, it's the B roads as well that are riven with potholes. Um, is there a danger that they get overlooked because the heavier traffic is on um, the bigger roads, but um, some of the bigger potholes are on the smaller roads? Well, one of the things I am examining is for the budget for 24-25, am I able to set aside a pot of funding for uh, rural roads? And that's one of the areas I'm exploring now with my officials. I'll have to wait until my budget is confirmed. But I think there is a valid argument that rural roads and rural communities feel they're left behind by government. And one of the ways we can start correcting that is by investing more money in them. And just uh, in terms of the million pounds that you have set aside to make a start on the issue of potholes, um, what kind of an impact do you think that will have? Because have, presumably, you know, arguably, it's going to be a drop in the ocean. Well, it, it will have a minimal impact, but we have also announced an additional £8 million for resurfacing schemes. For The, the, the million pounds was dealing with potholes, smaller version. But the million or the eight million pounds allows for more significant road surfacing to take place, and you may have noticed when you're out and around the roads, you're seeing more road closures, um, and that there's more diverted traffic. The reason for that being is that we have workers out there resurfacing significant stretches of road as a direct result of the investment I've made since coming into office. You've said you need to do things differently in the department from now on. Well, I just wonder what that actually means. Can you give solid examples of the kind of prioritisation that you're now engaged in and how that's going to affect overall decision making? Well, the, the first objective are the, are the number of objectives when I went into the department. One was to stabilise the budget, and I had to do that with the assistance of the executive. That has now been achieved. We were facing somewhere in the region of a £70 million overspend. As a result of the decisions taken by the executive early in the mandate, we're now no longer facing that overspend. I also wanted to deal with public sector pay. We have now put an offer to the executive collectively, to the civil service and other sectors within the public sector to deal with public sector pay, because that's an important issue to deal with. Uh, even in from them terms of staff morale, it's an important issue to deal with. So we have, we have on the way of achieving those two objectives, we have to wait on responses from some of the unions, but I, I believe we're on the way of achieving those two objectives. I then also wanted to ensure that my department, who had been left without a minister for two years, were were motivated to move forward. And it was quite clear to me when I went back to my department that a lot of good work had been done in the department in the absence of ministers, but everyone was waiting political direction. So I've spent this last number of weeks meeting senior officials, meeting officials at all levels, and setting out a programme of work. And, and it, it's seemed as thus. I could spend a lot of time dis discussing what I can't do. And there's a lot of things we can't do or we can spend our time and our energies of discussing what we can do, and that's going to be our objective over the next three years. The A5 is a huge issue for you, I know, and for your department. And you met with campaigners for the A5 upgrade on Monday at Stormont. You called their stories heartbreaking. We know that more than 50 people have died on the road since 2006. Tonight on the record, can you tell us what you and your department are doing to make that new road happen? 
I, I have statutory obligations in relation to any decision around a major road network or road infrastructure that I have to live up to. So what I'm doing is that I'm making sure that I have a robust case to move forward with in relation to delivering the executive's flagship priority, which is the A5. As you will be aware, and your listeners and viewers will be aware, it has faced numerous legal challenges over this last number of years. I want to assure, assure myself that when I'm in a position to make a decision around that, in line with my statutory duties, that when I do end up in court, and I believe I will end up in court, that I have a legally robust position to defend. And the outcome of that court case is that we deliver the changes that are required to the A5 and that we start delivering a road which is safe for the people who use it. Because as you said, the stories I have heard, not only at that last meeting, but previously, are heartbreaking. This is about people. It's about protecting and saving lives. And it's ensuring that no other families face the heartbreak that I have witnessed from those who have lost loved ones on that very, very dangerous stretch of road. You've also said you expect to find yourself in court again. You recently stood up in the Assembly and warned further legal challenges are likely. Within hours of you speaking, another life was lost on that road. What is your message to those who are engaging in the legal process to try to stop the upgrade happening or stop it happening in the way that you and others would like to see it happening? I, I would appeal to them to set their legal challenges aside. I can understand... and. and and there's only a minority, a very small group of people involved in this. I understand the connection between the farming community and their land. I'm from a rural background myself. I understand it. I get it. But I would say this to them. Their objections are causing delays. Those delays are costing lives. That's the stark reality of the situation we're in at the moment. So I, th there is no other major infrastructural project that I'm aware of that has been interrogated as closely as the A5 has been. We are being drawn through courts, through public inquiries. Every aspect of this road has been examined in detail. What we now need to do is reach a decision on the way forward. I will do that and I will do it in line with my statutory obligations. The objectors need to understand that every time they serve me with a court order, it puts another year on the project and possibly causes more lives to be lost on that road, unnecessarily, in my opinion. Of course, that is not their intention. And um, they would say that, that, oh, I, I that, that, that there is intention. no connection. And, and, and you'd want to be very careful not to directly... I, I accept make, it's make not it. their intentions, yeah. but it is the outworkings of what they're doing. The Irish government recently pledged €600 million Euro to the project. Do you see that as a game changer? It is, without doubt, a game changer. It is going to allow me to move forward with the project uh, when I'm able to make my decision. It is quite a significant investment from the Irish government and it's, and it's very, very welcome. This, this road will connect up the, the communities across this, uh, the, the, this island. So therefore, I think it's important that the Irish government did make a contribution. I, I, I think the UK government needs to step up and um, ensure that they're making a contribution also. The A5 upgrade is mentioned in the much-quoted UK connectivity report, which looked at co connections across these islands. The A5 is mentioned in that but there's no money to back up the, the, the British government's commitments around that. So I will be using every opportunity possible to raise that matter with the British government for them to come in and allow me the, the finances to move forward with this project. Earlier this month, Minister, you categorically ruled out private MOT testing along English lines. Why are you so emphatic about that? The, the privatisation of the MOT service will be a great disservice to the public sector workers who have given great commitment and dedication to the MOT service over many years. But it's in a mess and something it's, needs well, to be done. Well, let, let, let's work our way through it. MOT, ser MOT services are privatised in Britain and Britain is an outlier in this. Most European states have this, a system similar to what we have. Similar to what we have. It's Except not, theirs works but, much but, better well, than, than I'm ours sure, does. I'm not, I'm not sure what an, how much of an expert you are in European MOT systems, but um, we're talking certainly with the It would be hard to imagine a system that um, didn't well, work This system that, you're than ours. Your system that you're telling me doesn't work has delivered 1.2 million MOTs in have the you last tried to get an MOT year. recently? I have. I, I have. It's, it's pretty I, difficult. I have to go through the same system as everybody yep. else to get my MOTs. Yep. And, yes, it and it's a nightmare, isn't it? It's but we have, we have a number of marriages. How long did you have to wait for your MOT? I ha well, I was quite fortunate. I got onto the, the, the booking system and was able to get an MOT, not my local centre. Right. I had to travel, but it took me two or three days to okay, travel. Okay, right. And, and, and that's great. And people will be very pleased. And, yeah. and, and people will have had uh, similar experiences. But for an awful lot of people, 
It is a nightmare. It takes a very, very long time but and it is a very stressful process. Privatisation will not resolve it. But we do have a number of initiatives which will, in my opinion, see improvement in the near future. We're recruiting 50 new MOT examiners. We recently ran a recruitment exercise which seen 135 applications. That's very good. We are hoping to open a new centre in, in Hyde Bank within this next year. It's still not open. What's the delay? The, the delay has been caused, but the construction was delayed as a result of COVID, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, yeah, but it's have, ready to go now, isn't it? We have the equipment in, but my, my officials are not satisfied that that equipment is meeting the standards they expect at this stage. So there's further testing taking place. The, my officials are engaging with the providers of that equipment and working through the difficulties and the challenges of that are there. So, so a new system with new equipment, and you're not satisfied <laughs> that that new equipment in a new building is, is actually fit for purpose. It, but but the, 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 the scope or the spec that we have ordered is fit for purpose. We want to make sure that the equipment that has been installed fits the spec and scope that we expect from it. So I think quite rightly, uh, the, the taxpaying public would expect me to ensure that before I open that centre or before I sign off on anything with, with the contractor, that the equipment that we have purchased using public money is fit for purpose. Sure, That's the sure. Process but they, 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 they would expect the it to be organised and delivered mm. as quickly as possible as well because it is public money that's paying for it and we know that the system is not good at the moment. Can you give us a date for when that new Hyde Bank centre is likely to be operational? I, I can't give you a firm date. And the reason I'm not giving you a firm date is because I won't give a firm date until my officials and I are satisfied that the centre is fit for purpose. Yeah, but you're not very frustrated that it's sitting there and it's not fit for purpose, it's not ready to go yet. When, well, you know, in an ideal world, it would it would simply be a case of finishing it off and opening it up. And that's not happening. Uh, unfortunately, politics is not often in the ideal world or in, in, when you're dealing with large scale public sector contracts, it's often not in the ideal world. I, I, I'm not frustrated. I am determined to get that centre open, but I will only sign off on it when I am satisfied that the equipment in it is fit for purpose. OK. Um, talks between TransLink and the unions representing public transport workers have resumed. Can you commit to offering any additional funds to TransLink to help end that dispute? At, at the start of the interview, I outlined to you that one of my objectives was to stabilise my budget and I received a lump sum from the executive to do that. I have given TransLink all the financial support I can at this time. So there's no more money? I have no further finances or available monies to give to TransLink. But the, there is ongoing discussions between the transport unions and TransLink. And I think we should give those discussions and negotiations space to allow them to develop. Because as we know from the world of politics, talking is good. And when you're talking, you can find resolution. So. Let's give both sides the opportunity to uh, conclude those discussions and, and give them space to do so. OK. Um, your predecessor as Minister Nicola Mallon ordered a cross-border all-island review of rail. That made a number of recommendations. I suppose that's all about long-term planning. But you, you, you have talked in the Assembly of um, 200 kilometre per hour trains um, travelling from Portadown to Dungannon to Oma and on to Derry. Given the restrictions that you have as far as your budget is concerned, given the difficulties that you've got in actually delivering public projects on time. Is that not all a bit pie in the sky? Well, uh, as I said earlier on as well, uh, let's talk about what we can do rather than what we can't do. And there's an opportunity here to correct a mistake that was made 60 years ago in closing down our railway lines and uh, closing down railway stations, particularly in rural communities. And as we move through and, and face the challenges of, of climate change and react to the Climate Act that was passed by the Assembly, we are going to have to invest significantly more in public transport. So the investments we're talking about are 10, 15, 20 years down the track. It's, pardon the pun. But there is an opportunity here to do great things, particularly for rural communities who've been left behind for decades. Quick final question. Um, any parting words for Leo Varadkar, who's standing down as Fine Gael leader in Taoiseach? Uh, I, I think when you reach the, the heights of politics, which Leo has reached, then it takes a lot of commitment and time and pressure on the individual and on their family. So I, I give him credit for serving his country, but I think he's done the right thing by standing down. What they need to do now is call an election. Why do they need to call an election? There's no need constitutionally for an election to be called. Except there's no need constitutionally. But Leo stood down because, in his own words in a way, he had no fresh ideas. He's a reflection of that entire government and that cabinet. Even the, pro the projective 
new leader, the new Taoiseach, he's been around the cabinet for about 10 years. So if Leo has ran out of ideas, then I think it's fair to say the entire cabinet has ran out of ideas and it's time for a fresh mandate. OK, um, to be fair, Sinn Féin's track record's not great on leadership elections, is it? There's never been an election for oh, uh, I, your party president. I think you'll find I stood for an election for my... There's, you, 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 so, not, 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 not for party president. No, for vice president. Yeah. But, so there yeah. is, it is doable. And, uh, and, also, that, was, and that was and, controversial. And, and your party co-ops MLAs and councillors without much consideration for um, who people voted yeah. for on and a regular if, basis. If the, the media reports are correct... There's going to be an anointment in relation to Fine Gael's leader for the next Taoiseach. So it's part of the mechanism. I'm not objecting to that mechanism. What I'm objecting to is that after over a decade in power, the current Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, and the new addition of the Greens is ran out of ideas. They need to go back to the people and refresh for a mandate. Yes, yeah, just political opportunism though, isn't it? Here's a man who gave you £600 million for the A5 upgrade and as soon as he says he's going, you uh, use that as an opportunity to call for a general election. But I think it's, I think the, 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 the new Taoiseach will be the third Taoiseach of this cabinet since the last election. We had Michal Martin, we had Leo, and now we're going to have someone else. You need oh. to be very careful because after the next general mm. election in the Republic, there could be a coalition government and Mary Lou could find herself as a Taoiseach in a revolving capacity with one of the other leaders and those words that you've just um, uttered might come back to haunt you. Well, I, I'd be delighted if Mary Lou is Taoiseach in, in, in the next doll and the arrangements for that will be... In a revolving capacity, well, as well, I've just suggested. Will be negotiated amount. But my objection to this is this is the third time we have a new Taoiseach without an election. Let, what, what, I, don't think, I don't think it's undemocratic. In fact, it, it's the very emphasis of democracy to call for an election. John O'Dowd talking to me earlier. Well, let's get some reaction to what the minister had to say. I'm joined now by the former infrastructure minister, Nicola Mallon, who now lobbies for the haulage industry, the DUP MLA Deborah Erskine, who chairs Stormont's infrastructure committee, and the leader of the Green Party, Mal O'Hara, who's a former Belfast City councillor. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. Deborah Erskine, first of all, what did you make of what John O'Dowd had to say there about the new MOT uh, centre at Hyde Bank. We don't know if this is an issue with hardware or software. Did you know about it? Yes, um, the infrastructure minister did come to the committee um, and he spoke at length to the committee, um, not just on MOTs, but a whole range of issues. Um, I raised with the minister about the new MOT lift cracks um, that have been found in uh, testing equipment. And then we did get some information in relation to what's happening at the new test. But not in open, he didn't say what he said in that interview tonight in open session in front of your committee last week, did he? No, he didn't because... So that was a private briefing? It was a private briefing. And the reason because is because there is commercially sensitive information in relation to that, which we also have to be aware of. But I am aware that this is a software hardware issue in terms of uh, the issues that are going on at the new centre. Well, I wonder what has changed since his appearance before the committee last week. That was a private briefing behind closed doors. But he is now saying tonight, very publicly on the record, that the equipment that is in place in the new Hyde Bank Centre, which was meant to be open now already, is not fit for purpose. People will find that, frankly, astonishing. Well, it is astonishing. It's disappointing. Um, because we should be in a place where a test centre should be open, it should be in use, it should be dealing with some of the backlogs that are uh, in the system at the minute. Anybody who's watching the programme tonight who drives a car will know exactly what the issues are in relation to MOT testing. And this is another long list of disappointments when it comes to DVA testing in relation to the backlogs that are in the system. But it did seem that the Minister was very quick to, to defend it there. I mean, he started telling me how many uh, tests the current system actually deals with um, and the pressures that the system is under. But, you know, he, it's OK for him. He, he managed somehow or other to get himself an appointment within two or three days. I mean, you're waiting at the moment, like you said yourself in the committee, you're waiting for an MOT yourself. Um, have you been as fortunate as the minister? Have you got such a speedy appointment? Unfortunately not, Mark. Uh, I'm still waiting on my MOT test appointment. So, so what he quoted for himself is, of course, correct, but it's very unusual. 
for, for three days. Yes. yes. I mean, I'm dealing with constituents day and daily who are coming to me. This is this is not new that uh, constituents and people in Northern Ireland are having to wait long times to get their MOT tests. But that shouldn't be the norm. I heard the DVA chief executive say that 72 days is now the new norm. That should not be the case in Northern Ireland. I would actually go as far as to say it's longer than 72 days. I mean, I went on to book online to get my MOT test appointment. No tests available. Went on this week again, August. When I clicked in, no tests available. That is an unacceptable position for people in Northern Ireland. And we need to deal with this issue head on. Um Nicola Mallon, I, I, you're here representing the whole age industry, but I do have to ask you, in your capacity, as a former infrastructure minister, when, when you see the current incumbent talking about the difficulties within the system, I mean, to some extent, you might say playing down the difficulties within the system, but admitting that the equipment in this new all-singing, all-dancing Hyde Bank Centre is not fit for purpose, um, and when you hear about the kind of delays that the chair of the committee is dealing with at the moment, which will strike a chord, I suspect, with a lot of our viewers, what do you make of it? Well, as you say, my job now is to represent our members in Logistics UK. Um, but I know that the Minister for Infrastructure, John O'Dowd, has a very difficult road ahead of him. Um, the Department for Infrastructure is a department that has been historically underfunded for many years. Um, he is grappling with one-year budgets, and yet he has to commit to long-term spend. Um, and he also has workforce challenges, and I have no doubt issues around morale in the department um, as well. Um, and the Department of Infrastructure is a very difficult department in the sense that it impacts on people's everyday lives, be it MOTs, potholes, street lighting, key road projects. Um, but it doesn't have the same pull on the heartstrings as the health minister would have or the education minister, which makes the battle for priority allocations of funding around the executive um, very difficult. So there is no doubt that he has a difficult job ahead of him. But we are delighted that the infrastructure minister is in place, that we have locally elected, locally accountable ministers around that executive table because they live in this place, they care about it. And we want to be engaging with them on behalf of our members who are really Die, really, really wanting to see progress on key infrastructure projects, the A5, which the minister mentioned, York Street Interchange, um, the New East Southern Relief Road, given its connectivity to Warren Point Port and also the Belfast Dublin Corridor. Skills, uh, workforce shortages currently and with future projections is another area. And finally, but one of the most important is the support that is required from both the UK government and the Northern Ireland executive to help the logistics industry transition to net zero. Yeah, so while the minister says um, he needs to be sure that this new equipment is fit for purpose before he will sign off on this Hyde Bank MOT centre, people will be very aware that this comes down to safety on our roads, of course. And I know the system is different for um, the kind of uh, haulage uh, vehicles that, that that you're actually dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. They, they don't have to book through the same system that um, people who, who drive domestic um, vehicles is concerned. Maybe that's a, a very good thing. You've got sympathy for the position that he is in. But at the end of the day, it is about making sure that vehicles are safe on the roads. And lorry drivers need to know that the cars that they are actually um, seeing and driving alongside are safe and fit for purpose as well. So we shouldn't forget that that's at the heart of this debate. No, and of course it is. And obviously the haulage industry has a different process, standing appointments. But of course we need to have greater capacity within the MOT system. And that's why it is disappointing to hear that Hyde Bank, which was going to bring that additional capacity online, is now going to be delayed because of the reasons that the minister has set out. So I think it would be important that there's greater clarity given in respect of all of that so that people know where they stand. Okay, Ma Mal O'Hara, you're not a car driver and uh, <coughs> you wish that fewer of us uh, drove cars, but we are where we are as far as this is concerned. Um, and in terms of not least the safety issue that, that we've just been talking about there, are you concerned about the situation that this doesn't appear doesn't appear at this stage to be getting any better, any easier for people. No, and, and Mark, I think um, you know some of the ideas that we've heard from different parties and, and from across the water about moving to a 
biannual MOT just simply doesn't fly. I mean, we know that a third of vehicles fail their first MOT um, on the first attempt, and that means that they're not roadworthy and there's a risk around safety there. So it so directly idea, relates to the safety issue. Exactly, and, that, and that, I think that's what's paramount for people. And if we're talking about the delays that uh, Deborah has talked about today and months and months that people are waiting, we have unsafe vehicles on the road all the time. So I'm glad that the Minister has identified it as a priority to move on, but I'm frustrated um, that it took the Minister so long to talk about climate and the net zero challenge and the transition to a uh, public transport and complete modal shift. Um, I, and, you know, I have ideas and policy ideas about that. And I think the minister said, you know, that, that the, the current government in the south have run out of ideas. When he looks at what the transport minister has done in the south, he could replicate some of those and that would give him policy. We ideas. did hear the minister, though, confirm his commitment to the All Island Rail Review. That is, as he said himself, a long term and an expensive project. Mm -hmm. At this stage, is it actually pie in the sky and maybe we need to be realistic about that? Well, I, I think, Mark, we go back to what those policy solutions are. You know, we're talking about the All Island Rail Review, 0.3 billion per year over the next 25, 30 years. So it's a significant investment. But what happened in the South was the Minister, Eamon Ryan, the Green Minister for Transport, transitioned. And instead of spending two thirds of the budget on roads, he changed that to two thirds on public transport. Fares have been reduced successively over a number of years. They have also put on new bus routes every single week, over 100 new bus routes connecting villages and towns to cities and rail infrastructure. That's the sort of radical thinking that I want to hear from a new infrastructure Okay, I want, to, I want to come on to talk to you all about the, the A5 and the minister addressed that issue and he said he, he expects to end up in court he expects legal challenges um, to that project to, to continue. The government in Dublin is, of course, paying 600 million euro towards the project, and that includes the Greens. You are the leader of the Green Party in Northern <coughs> Ireland. How do you feel about that? Well, I think, Mark, that was part of the deal. That was part of the backroom negotiations in terms of getting the Assembly back in the North. Let's, you know, that there would be some contribution through the shared island unit towards infrastructure projects in the North. And I hope the UK government and the executive follow through on those as well. That wouldn't have been my priority, but I understand that's part of the deal. What I'm glad to see in that infrastructure project is new early rail services coming on the enterprise from Dublin to Belfast. That's the start of that transition in rail. We need to see a lot more of it and I hope to see in the future more money allocated to those type of public transport infrastructure projects. And Deborah Erskine, as chair of the committee, do you back the minister's appeal for legal challenges to the A5 project to cease? Well, just to pick up on a point there that Mal has made, the commitment of that funding was actually 2007 in relation to uh, Dr Ian Paisley whenever he led the executive. And uh, what we actually see is the contribution is now in and around 30% of the overall project cost um, in comparison to what was 47% in 2007. That's just a little point I wanted to pick up on in relation to that. But in terms of the, the legal challenges, look, people will have viewpoints. Um, people are entitled to have viewpoints, but safety on our roads is paramount. And there will be people who will be watching tonight who have had loved ones lost on that road. I represent um, part of uh, where the A5 falls into my constituency. And uh, there is an awful lot of times where the news comes through that the road is closed and you know that unfortunately, perhaps somebody is either seriously injured or somebody has lost their life along that road. And we do have to ensure that road safety is paramount for anybody that travels along yeah. that road. So, so do you back his call for those who have been um, repeatedly getting involved in legal challenges to now cease? Because he says no other project in Northern Ireland has been looked at and examined in such detail up to now. Well, we've had reviews and we've had reports and we've had legal challenges. Now he that says have we need decisions. On. We do need decisions in relation to uh, an awful lot of road projects and an awful lot of projects facing infrastructure. It's not for me uh, to just say to people, you need to stop 
doing this, I can appeal to people. But we also have to recognise, Mark, that there are people who are living along that road who do have land and one thing or another. And we do have to create a balance and make sure that those voices are listened to as well. So you're basically they saying you, you, you don't support his call and that you think it's reasonable no, for those I'm, individuals I'm, I'm, to continue with their legal challenges? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that I disagree or agree. I'm saying... I'm saying that it is important that road safety is paramount. There is funding that has been committed there. It's important that we move forward now and try and get progression on this project. It's okay. vitally important for our uh, economy as well. Nicola as well will know that from her perspective and I, and as well. I, and I want to bring you in on that very point. It is very important for, 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 for economic reasons, uh, particularly to the haulage sector. Um, has the time now come for decisions to be taken and for um, legal challenges to stop, as the Minister has said on this programme tonight? The A5 should have been built a long time ago. Um, people have lost their lives. That comes first and foremost. It is also a key economic corridor um, that ensures we get the goods that we all need. So for all of those reasons, it must be built. But we need to look at the root causes of these issues. And we need procurement reform. We need planning reform. And under the COVID recovery plan signed off by the executive, there was a commitment to establish an indep independent infrastructure commission to take a long-term strategic view of infrastructure. Um, and that really needs to be progressed as well. And I really hope that the Minister for Infrastructure, working with his executive colleagues, will drive that forward. OK, um, thank you very much indeed. Mallow Hara, just one final question to you. It looks like you could be heading to the uh, Shannad in Dublin. Nominations close tomorrow. The election, uh, the general election is, of course, um, a maximum now of one year away. So I just wonder what you hope to achieve as someone who may well end up having one of the shortest tenures ever potentially, in the Senate? Well, I think you can do a lot in a year, Mark. Um, and I think the, the impetus for me to go for the Senate seat and to put my hat in the ring was that we were losing a Northern voice in, in the form of Senator Nile O'Donnelly of Sinn Féin, and there wasn't other Northern representation. I think authentically, in the background I have in the community biology sector as an activist, I can represent others um, and, and nationalists and unionists um, as, a, as a fair arbiter in the Senate in the South. So I think it's an exciting opportunity to amplify voices that haven't been heard before. Okay, and just, I mean, yes or no, do you think you'll be successful? Do you think you'll get the seat? I don't want to count any chickens, but I hope so, and we'll know who's in the field tomorrow. You're certainly optimistic. I'm very optimistic. Okay, well, um, well we wish you well, and um, that'll be a very interesting development if it happens. Um, thank you all very much okay. indeed for uh, joining us on the programme tonight. Let's turn to Dublin next, uh, where the repercussions of yesterday's sudden and unexpected resignation by Leo Varadkar are still being felt. It looks like um, Fine Gael is about to be involved in a coronation rather than a runoff for its uh, new leader with Simon Harris all but wearing the crown already. That means he'll take up office in a few weeks as the new Taoiseach. Let's get the latest from Gavin Riley from Virgin Media News who joins us now um, from Dublin. Um, uh, Leo Varadkar acknowledged many people would um, ask this question. So I'm going to ask it. What, what do you think might be the real reason he stepped down so abruptly yesterday? Um, I think, to be honest, if there was any ulterior motive or any kind of scandal at brewing and he explicitly said that there wasn't yesterday, then he would be completely hanged and foisted by his own petard if there were. Um, in truth, I genuinely think that he is a little bit jaded. Um, he has been in cabinet for 14 years of unbroken service. He has been party leader and Taoiseach or for a while Taunashta for seven years and I imagine that it simply just has taken a lot out of him. Um, I was with him last week when he was in Washington for the St. Patrick's Day festivities. I was there uh, alongside your own Enda McLafferty and he struck me as someone who was maybe a little bit detached. The schedule was a little bit different this year but it ultimately meant that there were 48 hours fallow where the Taoiseach was in Washington on St. Patrick's weekend and would have been able to get basically any meeting that he wanted to. Um, but there was very little initiative from Leo Varadkar to do that. Instead, he was simply happy to be a passenger at other events that Joe Biden invited him along to. So in truth, I just think that he was maybe a little bit detached, a little bit checked out. And I think that after seven years of leading his party and being a Taoiseach or a de facto co-Taoiseach, I, I just think that he's, in truth, a little bit burnt out. Um, can I ask you, just before we move on to his um, potential uh, successor as Fine Gael leader and Taoiseach, how would you assess in 30 seconds Leo Varadkar's tenure at the top? 
Um, mixed, I think, is, is the short answer. I think that there are certain societal reforms that a lot of people will remember. Certainly the fact that he was at the helm when we had that pivotal referendum uh, back in 2018 to liberalise abortion laws. Uh, in time, people might come to think that it was also rather brave of him to engineer a grand coalition with Fianna Fáil, the party that Fine Gael always defined itself as being against. And of course, there was his leadership when he was in a caretaker capacity in the first few months of the COVID-19 pandemic. But long term, when people look back at this period, they will also see an economy that was doing very well, big picture, but they will also see many people struggling with the cost of living, record employment, but a record number of people living in emergency accommodation. So they will see it as perhaps great in the big picture and struggling when it comes to finer detail. So it does seem, Gavin, doesn't it, as if there's going to be a coronation now. Um, nominations for the party leadership close on Monday already. Simon Harris, the Minister for Further and Higher Education, has 35 out of 54 parliamentary uh, party members backing him. All serious contenders have said uh, at this stage that they don't intend to run. He's been talking uh, to Virgin Media News tonight. What's he been saying? Uh, he's been saying a few things. Firstly, uh, possibly good news for Mal O'Hara if he's still in the studio because he's basically been saying that this government has a lot of work to do and that he plans to basically try and serve the full term. Uh, so that means that he's not going to be calling a general election somewhat prematurely. That means that we're probably not going to have a new doll being elected until next March and that might mean that Mal O'Hara or whoever defeats him in that race for the Shannon is going to be there until possibly June uh, of next year. He's also been saying very explicitly that irrespective of what happens in the next election and although he wants to be constructive and he will listen to any good idea that no matter what happens and irrespective of what platforms they put forward he wouldn't intend to form a coalition with Sinn Féin after the next election that he is basically limiting his options to a renewal of the government that he currently has and the government that he's about to step into as the leader of that partnership with Fianna Fáil and with the Greens or potentially some other party coming in perhaps to make up the numbers if the Greens aren't able to do so very much as steady as she goes at the one thing that Simon Harris was promising is that he wants to to give a little bit more, uh, a little bit more energy, perhaps. So he f did feel that Leo Varadkar's personal jadedness was may maybe uh, bearing through in government, and the one thing he wants to do is perhaps deliver a little bit more energy than might have been seen up until now. You'll not be surprised to hear, Gavin, that uh, Mal O'Hara is uh, smiling at the prospect of uh, of getting a full year in the Shannon if he's successful <laughs> in this vote. Um, no surprise to anybody there. The Irish Independent reported um, one Fine Gael TD claiming Simon Harris, and I'll quote, came out of the womb wanting to be leader of a political party and Taoiseach of Ireland. What kind of a character is he? Because he wouldn't have a very high profile here in Northern Ireland, it has to be said. No, he, he, it is fair to say he was certainly ambitious and I did put this point to him when we were interviewing him for Virgin Media News tonight, this idea that, you know, it's been such a shock and awe campaign that the campaign was barely on and suddenly it was over because he had the whole thing sewn up. And he made no bones about talking about his own ambition, that this is something that he always had in his agenda. He didn't expect the vacancy to come up as quickly as he did, uh, but nonetheless he is there. Um, one thing people may find is that he, he is somewhat in the mould of Leo Varadkar. He is an excellent communicator. And again, he was the Minister for health uh, during that caretaker administration in the first couple of months of COVID-19. And he really managed to resuscitate his own political fortunes. At the previous government, the general election we had in February 2020, uh, was caused because there was a motion of no confidence in him that was going to succeed. Then COVID came along and suddenly his ability to be calm and compassionate in his messaging was something which really stood to him. A lot of critics might say that he is not okay. someone who really obsesses over finer details. He's not a delivery man, but certainly as a communicator, he has very few peers. All right, got to leave it there, Gavin. Thank you very much indeed. That's just about it for tonight. I'll be back at the weekend with Sunday Politics at the usual time of 10 o'clock on BBC One. And if you missed any of tonight's programme, you can, of course, catch it again on iPlayer. For now, though, from everyone in the team, thanks for watching. From all of us, good night.